so test bakes notwithstanding, uh, we're just going to redo the UVs on this. So the first thing I'll do is open up my UV configuration, select the UV map I want, and we've got, uh, typically when you do the method that I do where you copy and paste from the high poly, you end up with a bunch of, well, you get the UVs from the high poly, if it had any. Uh, in this case it did, but easy enough to fix, just right click it and say clear, you know, and they go away. So starting from a clean slate. Now, before I start this unwrapping, um, I do want to uh, remind you that I bake uh, with object space normals. Now that means that the rules about where I break my UV islands are gonna be different from someone who bakes with tangent space. Um, I don't really care that much about hard edges. I don't have to care that much about splits and breaks and that kind of thing. So some of the stuff you see in here may shock you. Uh, some of it may offend you, but just know that in the end, it's all going to work out just fine. So let's start with the low hanging fruit first. Let's grab this thing and we'll bash it down to a nice flat bit like that and just hide that out. Check this out. That we can probably bash down to a single island and have that bake. This thing is, is interesting. Let me grab that. This, I probably will split up a little bit because I'd like to, uh, yeah, I like to um, not completely stress the system out. You know what I mean? What is, oh, okay. We've got a, you know, a bottom on this piece and that kind of thing, but that's okay. We will, do that top part together. Do that as an island and do this as an island. Okay, that all came in the correct way. Hide that. So to finish this up, I've done a quick pack here just to see where we're at. So we only have these things UV'd. So usually what I do when I UV things is I UV pieces, hide them, UV the next piece, hide it, that kind of thing. I just progress along like that until I get done with it. So this I'll map flat, this part in here. I will, let's try a cylinder unwrap on this. Okay, that came out pretty good. And this, I'm just going to slam that into a straight, <laughs> or so I believe anyway. good enough. Yeah, sometimes uh, the motor relax routine, well, it won't relax. It's all hyper and it, it wants to do weird crap. So we're going to put the seam on the bottom of this. Uh, this is one trick I do with unwrapping. I will select uh, the polygons that I want to unwrap, hop into edge mode. I'll select the edge I want to unwrap with or you know, where to put the seam. And then I just hop over here and I fire off the unwrap, which is the same as the unwrap over here on the menu. It's nothing special. And I'll just fire that off. And so I get a nice unwrap on that hide. You know, when it comes to UVs, it's really all about the rapid fire because typically it doesn't matter that much. Like here, I, I'll just, I'll just stick with this. I, I was going to try to get a little fancy maybe, but uh, no, we'll save the fanciness for a future video. So once again, the relax is not happy. So I'll hit it with a conformal relax first to get it in place and then an angle based one to relax it out a bit uh, and then hide it. There's really no rhyme or reason there. Just, well, uh, no more than that's what I've discovered works. Now here's one that might give some people hives, but um, you know, and it might not work out in the end, but we'll see how it goes, right? So I'm going to UV that half as, an, as a planer and, and UV that half as a planer. And I was planning, or I was tempted to get a little more abusive there, but I'm just gonna leave it there for now. Okay, we'll hit that with a flat. This stuff I'll bet I can do 
as a cylinder. Yeah, I haven't found um, I haven't found a, a good way of doing a cylinder that's um, that's generic. Like I always have to try it on a specific axis and then try the other one when it doesn't work out. Uh, I don't love that, but it works well enough that I'm not going to sweat it too hard. Right, he's being real grouchy about this. So let's start down here. So let's we'll just start down at the bottom here and get these sections mapped independently. Can we do adaptive on this one? Now, I don't know why adaptive is being so, why, why is this such crap? What if I do a, a Those overlapping polygons there are weird. And I don't exactly understand what's happening. For now, I'm not gonna worry about it. And I'm sure I will regret that later. But for now, I'm just gonna carry on. This I'm gonna hit it with an unwrap. Because I think it'll probably be better served that way. Okay, now we're back to the, uh, the base. Uh, the base shape that we had, but actually the strategy is not going to change here. I'm going to grab the top and bottom. Half halfway in seems great. We'll s shoot these out here, align them, hide them, grab. Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna so so for the actual bake, we're gonna break this up on each corner like that. Just so it has the maximum uh, opportunity to be straight and work nicely and all that good stuff. Actually, let me get this instead. And then we'll take this bit this bit project that it, it, it's kind of tilted which is weird but we're going to go with it because maybe there's going to be something there later that I'll uh I'll want to correct okay so everything's UV now, and uh, you know, I used to advocate using uh, I pack that or you know, external packers, but honestly, the auto packer uh, inside of Moto is like my 99% of the time workhorse these days. So we're gonna just use the packer. Uh, I think I'll set it down to like 10% gap. And I think the rest of it just, I just leave alone. Yeah, just tell it to go. Right, you know, it really obviously likes rectangular shapes, uh, and there is. So this auto packer has problems with stuff like this. Um, you know, this island with the hole in the middle. The one failing of this packer is that Moto will never use this space inside this UV island. If they would just add that, this auto packer would be everything you would ever need. Now, in terms of this mesh, I think this pack is fine. We're going to roll ahead with this and do our bakes and all that, but. Just keep in mind that if you have large circular objects like the outside ring of something and you UV it flat, that space inside is not going to be used. So either you have to break an edge and lay it out flat or break it into uh, like like two curves, right? You, uh, that can pack inside of each other, like a kind of offset and you'll get a much better pack. So just you know, be aware of that. Okay, I've turned back on the normal map and we will... Uh, Actually, that was dumb because I have to update the uh, the cage. So, actually there's a few things to talk about here. So this is the way I set up my little poly, that's all correct. Now what I will typically do is I will, okay. 
first let me get the cage set up. So I'm going to go ahead and clear the cage just because, you know, we added a bunch of new stuff and I don't want to deal with it. I'll turn off the normal map for now. So I'll just sit out here at the, at the polygon level, use the push tool and get us out so we're clear of the stuff. I think maybe that's a little much, something like that. It's such a small mesh that you can get overzealous with the push and end up with a bunch of stuff that folds over itself and all that. But this looks at first blush to be okay. So save that. And let's give it a quick bake just to verify that things are on the rails. Okay. Uh, this is looking more promising than before. <laughs> so this is going to bake out and then we'll have a look at the various things that we had or the various assumptions we had made and see if things still hold up true or not. Mm -hmm, looks okay. Some stuff on here may look a little strange to you still if you're used to tangent space normals, but for object space normals, this this looks pretty solid. Yeah, although there's no way to know until you look at it in the viewport. That's something that I keep, you know, I keeps getting repeated to people on forums and stuff. It, you know, they're like, oh, is this the right way? Is this the right way? And it's like, well, you know, did you look at it in the, you know, the game engine or in the viewport? Because seriously, that's all that matters. That. Let me. That looks much nicer on the high poly. So we're going to maybe change this and we'll add an inset loop right here. Cause I want to have that nice, that nice look there. And the normals were uh, messing up my bake. So we'll just, you know what, let's just go ahead. Let me grab the UVs for this thing and maybe relax those out again. Angle based. Okay. Well, there's probably no need to repack. That seems fine. But generally when you change the unwrap, change the vertices, whatever you, uh, you end up doing, you're going to want to, to redo the cage for that piece because you have inherently changed your vertex normals. So it's important to redo the cage, but luckily now all you have to do is select the part you want to redo, right click the uh, cage, the cage and say clear, and it only knocks that particular piece out. So you don't have to redo the whole mesh, which gets, you know, which is pretty nice when you have something that's complicated, you know, and there's lots of pieces, certain pieces you know, have to get pushed a long way and some a little way. And it, it's, it, you know, it, it, it can get hairy. All right. So with that extra support loop and a redone cage, let me just rebake that part. I want to see how much difference this makes, if any, because it's like a, uh, you know, it's like building a house or anything else. You need that, that solid foundation to build on top of, like you won't get a good texture map created if you have a bad bake on the bottom you know if there's shading errors or stuff's projecting funny or whatever like basically the normal map is the one time is the one shot you have at getting stuff straight and projected and looking good and you know if you're not happy with the normal map you're just not going to be happy with your ending material okay this is done let me see if this came out any better Okay, there we go. That, that straightened that out and that looks more like the high poly now. So that makes me happy. So that is one thing you will have with, uh, you know, with object space normals is you will sometimes have to add geometry to get a better projection and that kind of thing. Now it's not the end of the world, uh, honestly. This, this looks kind of funny down here, but remember what the high poly looked like right? 
had a round thing with a you know with a six sided thing and you know stuck down below it and then it went into the high poly well if we just look at our low poly now you can see we have that same thing round piece six sided piece upper piece because this is projecting now I probably could straighten out this projection by throwing in a loop there but okay so but perhaps I will just because I want just because I want to because this is uh, you know we're trying to learn something here too Whew. let me just clear the part I want to work on push that back out and we'll just try a test break a, a, you know, a test bake real quick while I talk about stuff so so the reason I was kind of waffling there is that that's that screw dial that sits on top of the mesh that you can't see that part you know unless you like tilt the guitar pedal up and look you know and look underneath the button or whatever so I normally wouldn't really care about that but I'm curious to see whether we can make that projection look cleaner you know by adding a uh, a loop and I think this is that shell down here in the bottom corner that's the one that's actually doing it we'll see here in a second I think that will be uh, that'll put us in the money but if it doesn't yeah it's it's no big deal because it's you know, like I say it's something you can't even really see all right yeah you know, it's better and we'll leave it but typically I probably wouldn't bother okay now our screw head is not projecting straight you can see that but that I can fix by adding an edge loop you know or not sure what happened there but um yes we'll add an edge loop through the center of the screw head this is how you can fix your screw head projections and I'm glad this happened you know, cause now we can demonstrate oh I will grab that and that uh, using you know William Bond's handy script to easily split the verts in the order that I, I selected them now remember we do have to redo the cage here so let me clear that and push this back out again and I am going to rebake this because I want to demonstrate how that I'm going to hope that it fixes it because it's that's what that's what should fix it but we'll fire it up here and see and honestly this is the kind of workflow that I go through I will like I'll bake stuff I'll look at I'll typically try to batch things up a little more I mean right now I'm like oh we'll fix this fiddly thing this fiddly thing this fiddly thing and I'll generally you know when I'm in a production thing and I need to get work done I'll like you know I'll give the mesh a big once over fix a whole bunch of stuff at once and rebake just once or twice Sorry, I keep hitting the mic. I'm not used to this new setup completely yet. But when this gets done, we'll take a look and I believe that will fix it. Um, it's right here on the on the UV mat. It looks better, but we'll see in a second once we see it on the mesh, which is always the true test. Hmm. Yeah, it looks better. It's not perfect. But that's actually kind of what the high poly looks like, to be honest. So it's like that, and then I'm like, uh, hold on, yeah, there we go. All right, you know what? We're gonna roll with that for now because that'll, that's fine for demonstration purposes. So this is in panel lines are in. These screw heads look straight. This thing looks fine. Oh yeah, this is the socket where it's going to sit. So yeah, we left this solid because we don't really care. And that ridge that was on the side, we're just going to let that roll. Now this projection, I, I'm, I'm not loving. That's definitely going to show up as weird, I think. Yeah, it's just kind of how that is, but that's all right. Um, 
I'm, I'm going to insert you know a couple extra edge loops here just to straighten that out as, as much as I can. But then we're going to, uh, well, there's my timer. Then we're going to push this out. All right, turn off the cage. Let's get a look at the bulb. That looks fine. And this thing actually looks pretty good. There's a little waviness through here, but that's almost not avoidable when it comes to, uh, you know, when it comes to cylindrical shapes. This, the rest of this looks okay. And I think we can call that a success for the most part. All right, I am going to do one last test bake on this. And then we will do the real bakes that were, you know, like the higher res ones that will send to Substance Painter. Now you may have some concerns about these edge loops that I'm inserting to, you know, to fix projections. And that's, that's sort of a, like on a prop like this, it doesn't really matter. You know, because this is only, well, I'm not sure what the triangle count is, but it's not very high. So a couple extra edge loops, it doesn't matter. Like, you're, it literally is negligible, and it comes out in the wash anyway. And since we're doing object-based normals, we can do larger UV islands, which means we have less breaks, which means that we have less vertices to begin with. So, you know, we've got, you know, we've got some spending money to splash around when it comes to that kind of thing. Now, if you have something that's that's repeated a hundred times on the mesh and you add four edge loops to it, that might be a concern. But for just fixing little projections and things, I I really wouldn't sweat it too hard. So before we get started on the uh, on the final baking process today, um, I wanted to talk about the uh, projection on these islands because you probably noticed, you know, and I commented on it that they came out kind of skewed, and. Now, why they're skewed, I don't know, but this does provide me an interesting opportunity here. So if I grab these polygons here, copy them out, and just, hold on. Let me make a copy of these. Pull them, pull them over here. Can I just get this done? Thank you. Okay, so normally when you have this kind of thing here and you tell it to, let me get to my UV controls, to hit it with a rectangle because I want to straighten out, it's like, Oh no, you know, it must be a grid pattern. That's not entirely true, okay? What it wants in reality is a grid pattern around the outside. The inside of that polygon can be whatever you want it to be. So watch this. If I grab this, it's got that same crappy middle that it didn't want to deal with, but the outside polygons are all, all quads. Now watch what happens if I hit rectangle. It's fine, it's perfectly happy with that. So that's a trick you can do. If you have islands that are all rectangular borders but messy insides, you can still use the rectangle tool and straighten them out. The only uh, yeah, catch, like I say, is you have to have that border in place. So anyway, just a quick tip to get this, uh, this section started. So we're just about ready to do the full bake, but I, there is one more step that I like to do. So uh, let me just show you my FBX uh, export settings. Uh, right now, uh, I export using Save Mesh Smoothness, not the Triangulate Mesh option. And I do that because I also want to uh, save mesh smoothness and save smoothing groups. That means whatever I do to the smoothing in here will be captured in the vertex normals uh, and exported successfully to things like Painter or Unreal Engine. So, yeah, because I have found a few uses for setting smoothing groups on low polys uh, recently, just to straighten out projections and things like that, nothing serious. But uh, if I don't have those options on, you know, you know they don't get exported, the smoothing doesn't match, and then the normal map's useless. You, uh, you know the drill. So, that being the case, that means that I need to control the triangulation myself. And I could, I could do this with a uh, with a mesh shop, and I plan to try that in the future. But for right now, what I do is I just take the low poly, I duplicate it, and then by 
a naming convention I just call it the LP bake. Do this, go into polygon mode, and tell it to turn it into triangles. Uh, if, you're, you know, if you're unsure why I'm converting the whole thing into triangles, it's because, uh, let's say you have a quad and you bake with that quad and Moto internally decides, oh, we're gonna break this quad down from top left to bottom right. Cause, cause you know, it does that internally. You, you don't see it, but that's what's happening. Then when you export to Painter, Painter decides, oh, that's a cool quad. Uh, I'm gonna break it down from the top right to the bottom left. Well, now you got a problem because if that face is not perfectly flat, which it might not be, this this split versus this split is going to it, it's going to give you different shading, which means that you're going to have a problem with the normal map. That's where you get those X-shaped kind of shading artifacts sometimes on meshes. Uh, it's because your triangulation doesn't match. So I just you know, I eliminate that problem by triangulating the mesh right now, you know, as a duplicate. I can always go back to this original one if I want to make tweaks and then recopy it again. But that's the reason for that, basically. So with that triangulated, um, uh, when I do my final bakes, I bake into render outputs. So I turn off the normal map down here. That was just for testing purposes. The actual outputs are over here in my shader tree. As you can see, there's a, a, a shading normal AO there's a shading normal, AO, and a surface ID output. I will usually turn all three on. In this case, I'm not gonna bother with the other two. I'm just gonna do the normal map. Uh, AO works good on more complicated meshes. This one I've got exploded, and we're gonna do the AO in Painter, just for the heck of it. Cause, I'll, uh, Cause I make a third variation of the low poly, you'll see here in a minute. So with that turned on, uh, I'll just look at my render settings real quick and show you this. So the render settings have a baking section within their properties, and this is the resolution that it's going to bake at. So my test normal map was was 2K, uh, but I baked the final maps at 4K. Um, it, uh, that's an old game development trick. You know, you you render at twice the res you need, and then you downsize for export, which gives you some anti-aliasing and smoothing and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, once I have my bake set up, my high poly is on the screen, everybody's marked as visible. And then I just go up to render, uh, render object to render outputs, use the cage, and we'll fire it off. So the normal map is baked and looks good to me. Now, uh, I talked about that render output, and I think I might have mentioned this before. Uh, I record these videos in segments, so I don't always remember what I already babbled about. But just in case I didn't mention it, uh, in my default uh, Moto file, you know, I've got my these render outputs are always there, and the shading normal is set to uh, the linear color space right here with this drop down. Now, what that means is the fact that I set it up there means that it automatically gets selected here. Uh, when I have a normal map bake. So when I hit save and put it out to a file, it, it saves in linear. That is the number one thing that screws people up when they start trying to bake normal maps in Modo. They aren't saving the normal maps out in linear color space. It's a super techie thing that you shouldn't have to worry about, but you do. So that kind of removes that from my thought sphere and just you know, automatically makes it work. So that's why I... Uh, or it's another reason why I like having that there automatically. Okay, so I'm going to, to export this LP bake out to the hard drive and then we'll convert the that object space normal to a tangent space normal using X normal. So when X normal starts up, there's other apps that can do this as well, but X normal is sort of the old workhorse that I know works correctly. So I, I just go to tools, tangent space converter, uh, I fill these fields in with the correct file names and I hit generate. Now generate runs for a couple seconds. Uh, X normal is pretty quick, you know, even with a 4K texture, it's actually pretty impressive. So we buzz, buzz, buzz through here and there's the tangent space normal. Now I'm gonna pull the mesh and this tangent space normal uh, into Substance Painter. Yes, hold on one second. 
So we're gonna jump back and forth here a little bit, but real quick, I wanted to show you how this works. So I come into Substance Painter, I say new project, I put in my uh, my LP Bake FBX, and I put in that tangent space normal that I just converted with X normal, and I say okay. This buzzes and comes in. Now it doesn't assign the normal map automatically, which is great, uh, because that gives you a moment to look at your mesh and make sure that the smoothing is the way that you uh, anticipate it looking. So basically this should look the same as it looks in Moto when there's no texture on it. Yeah, this looks fine to me. But sometimes you'll pull this in here and you'll find there's like hard breaks everywhere and there's some sort of a screw up and there was some vertex map attached to the mesh you weren't aware of and blah blah. So this is a good sanity check moment. So, and just to absolutely sanity check it, go into textures, I will drag that tangent space normal over here, put it on and just have a quick look at the mesh in this situation. So you can see we've got our normal map on there now and things are looking correct. Nice and flat, normals are straight, things look the way they're supposed to look. Okay, screw heads, all that jazz, great. Now, you know, from here you can bake out the rest of the maps and things, uh, and we will in a second, but this is not typically the way that I texture something. The way that I texture something is I make another low poly mesh. And I'll show you that right now. So it's nothing particularly fancy, but what I will do is I will take, I duplicate this over again, and I call this the LP paint, because this is what I take into Painter. Now all these individual pieces that I exploded out, those are fine and I will typically just make a copy of those and drag them over to the side. Then I'm going to make an assembled version of the mesh here in the middle. And this is where that original um, high poly mesh that we exploded out will come in handy. So I'm going to drag him over to here. Now recall that we were you know, in multiples of five when I did this, right? So this, I, actually this wasn't, this piece here wasn't necessarily that way, but uh, it is mirrored directly, so that's fine. Right, that's down there. Uh, it helps to have the high poly mesh around too, so you can kind of say to be check where things are. Pull him down. And then we will mirror him to the other side because that's what the high poly does. Okay, pull him down. Yeah. And basically just continuing on like this until I have the mesh put back together again. Okay, so fast forwarding to where I've got it all assembled again. This is the actual mesh here that we would use in the game. And I assemble it like this so I can, well, it's for a couple of reasons, so I can see what the actual thing will look like. So if I'm over here, excuse me, so if I'm over here painting something on this, you know, these, these individual components, I can look over here and see how that looks as part of the whole or whatever. It's just kind of a handy artist thing. Also, um, this allows me to bake out, you know, the AO if I want to, um, you know, using the low poly mesh and, uh, yeah, I just find this configuration is easier to paint with. So I'm gonna export this out, shoot it over to Substance Painter, and uh, we'll continue on from there. So now that I've pulled this into Substance Painter uh, and I assigned the um, you know, the normal map back to it again, you can see that you know, we now have a nicely assembled mesh and, a, and an exploded mesh that I can paint on. Now, uh, I did cheat a little bit because I went into this these pieces that were duplicated, for example, this uh, the, you know, uh, this foot pedal, I think it's called, or whatever it is, um, you had this little groove on the side. So I, when I duplicated that, I rotated it so that it's not completely obvious that it's the same piece. And I did the same thing with these twist, uh, these twist handles, right? That little screw head's pretty much a dead giveaway. But if you rotate those around, you get enough variation going on that it's still believable, uh, but you can get away with sharing it. 
Oh, you know, and that's the same with anything that you can can copy and duplicate. It's just you know, copy, shift a bit, copy, shift a bit, that kind of thing, and just get some, just get enough variation going that it becomes believable, if you will. So uh, now that it's here, I, I, I'm going to do a quick bake on the other maps. And my mouse is being weird for some reason. Strange. Okay. Well, I have a normal map, so I'm going to turn that off. Um, I'm going to bake. Yeah, we'll do 4K. Yeah, it's fast enough. Oh, we'll skip the ID map for now. Now, the ambient occlusion map is, is going to bake from the low poly. Well, it uses the normal map you have loaded and the low poly mesh. It's not a true ambient occlusion, but it's generally close enough. You know, to be you know, to be honest with you. Um, well, you know what? Let's just fire this off and let's see what it looks like because you know sometimes the you know default settings just look right. And uh, yeah, I'll be right back. Okay, so the bakes are done, and. Uh, actually, this is kind of fun because now I see this exploded mesh is going to show us the uh, uh, the AO nicely. So there's there's our contact AO that got baked out, and if we go over here, you can see that 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 does work. You know, it's down below those little twist ties and that kind of stuff. It's down in the crevices of these these insets, and uh, once again, no, it's not perfect. Yes, it's good enough. And here's that piece. Uh, that switch we talked about. You can see that now that the you know, curvature and AO and everything is on it, you can't entirely tell that we didn't actually hollow out that hole. So in the end, it doesn't matter. So in terms of the prop stage, this is generally a good point to do a sanity check. Um, you wanna make sure that the mesh looks good at this stage with just a basic bake on it and a white material. Um, I sometimes will even export this to the game engine and just look at it in the game engine and be like, okay, is this, you know, looking the way I want it to look? Because if it doesn't look good with just this stuff, just this basic setup, then it's, you could probably hide a lot of sins later with the texturing, but this is your bedrock, your foundation, making sure this looks good is going to serve you well in the end. So yeah, frankly, I'm pretty happy with this. This looks all right. I don't love the top of these buttons. I, I, you, if I was doing this for real, I'd probably go back and get rid of that hard little circle in the middle. But for demonstration purposes, this is fine and looks good. So uh, yeah, next up, we'll throw a smart material on it just for the heck of it and uh, wrap this baby up. And of course, the final stage to any prop is the texturing phase. We're gonna throw, um, a material on here that's basically silver you know, with a bunch of moss growing all over it. So this is a guitar pedal that's been left out in the forest for too long. Let's go with that. I'm going to add the environment opacity back just because it looks nicer at this stage. So yeah, you can see the AO is kicking in around the, you know, around the outsides of these things because this smart material uses those things. So you know, it's reacting to the AO that we baked, our non-perfect AO. Yeah, it's reacting with the curvature. It's got it all set up. So anyway, that is the basic process that we would go through for that guitar pedal. And from here, I would obviously just assign materials, tweak, you know, stencil some text on there, put it in the game and let the player toss this around in their inventory and have a look. So anyway, that's that prop. Uh, I had a lot of fun doing this one, actually. It was kind of cool to go back and work with somebody else's mesh. And we'll probably do more of this in the future because you know, I found this to be good to be able to walk through my process with someone else's stuff and have that sanity check that it does actually work. And it's not just me knowing how it works. So I subconsciously compensate for it. You know how I mean? Anyway, how about we just say thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.